<clears throat> oh, welcome, Chess College. Hi, everybody. It is Wednesday, um, hmm, the 15th, Income Tax Day. Do you guys paid your taxes this year? We got an extension, not April 15th because of the pandemic. July 15th. Yes, I got mine in on time. Um, you can get one more extension, I heard, to October 15th. Anyway, um, death and taxes. Can't avoid it. So um, I, this is we're down to our last week. One week from now, you guys will go off to your lives, and I'll still be here talking to myself in my room to a captive audience. Anyway, uh, it won't be you, though. It'll be some new people. So um, we're doing cinema this whole week. Hopefully you saw my announcements uh, to start uh, the discussion. I'm going to post the assignments for this week, tonight, today, and uh, talk about that. Um, get your... Um, Journals up and ready. You got to type them and upload them, and that'll all be due next week. I'll put those on there. You can start handing them in. Uh, you can hand them in now, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, you saw the samples. You should know what you're doing. You're talking about what you did each, what we did in this class each week, what you read in the in the book, what you uh, what we talked about in, on this thing. Um, our our big Zoom meeting was kind of a bust. Uh, but we introduced ourselves. I got to see some of your faces, and I appreciate that. Um, the lectures, the papers, paragraph a piece. We're here for six or seven weeks, so it shouldn't be more than two or three pages long. Uh, don't don't go overboard with it. Anyway, and how you, what you got out of it, if you learned anything, if anything meant anything. Uh, and I know some of it did, because in your papers, you will express your truth about never having heard of Rembrandt before. Uh, that's great. Now you know. That's what education is all about. Uh, you're not supposed to really know much of anything besides what you've learned in your years on the earth and other school, uh, colleges, classes, of course. Uh, anyway, so this is all perhaps new. That's fine. That's great. That's how it should be. Uh, breaking new ground is always interesting. Anyway, um, today I'm, I'm going to cover quite a bit of ground, and then I'll put the assignments up. So look for later on tonight. I'll put the assignments on, and the sketches are going, and uh, get your journals in, and that'll be it for the class. And uh, But I'm going to probably do another two lectures at least because I've got to cover – I'm trying to I'm going to cover some of them all the way up until – the pandemic, maybe. How fun that is. How we're all can't watch movies in the movie theater anymore. We have to watch them here online, uh, which is the new world order. Okay, so that's how the culture changes. The whole point, so much of this class, is what's going on in the culture. How does it reflect on the art? And so that's what those other, all those subjects we talked about before, from jazz to Picasso, what was going on in Picasso's world that made him paint that way? And when you learn about his world, then you understand his paintings more. When you understand what was going on in uh, jazz era in the 1950s with segregation and civil rights and the Cold War and the, um, all this good stuff, uh, you'll understand why jazz musicians were creating the music they were creating. When you understand what was going on in the 60s with the Vietnam War, with civil rights, with women's rights, uh, you might understand why rock and roll was such an important element of that generation. Uh, same thing with from punk rock in the 70s to hip hop in the, in the uh, 2000s. Why? Why now? The culture de almost demands it. And here's the art form that the culture demands. Uh, and so right now, a lot of things are happening in the culture. Obviously, the main one is the pandemic um, and all the politics, the weirdness in Washington, and all the us against them, people wanting to wear masks, and people don't want to wear masks, and people um, 
there's a rebellion going on in the world. You saw the Black Lives Matter movement last two weeks ago. Things are hopping. And so films and music, painters, writers are going to be reflecting on this for years to come. It's going to fuel a lot of movies and music and art. So what was fueling the movies and the art decades ago, long before you guys were around, long before your grandparents were around? Uh, but uh, so you probably hopefully you saw that little beginning uh, documentary I had you watch last week, kind of put you up to why movies were happening the way they were happening in the silent era, which would be from 1900 to say about 1927. Uh, why certain movies are popular, like Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd. Well, because uh, what was happening in the culture, uh, we just came out of World War I. We survived the war, and uh, we're in a party mode. And they called it the Roaring Twenties. And guess what? Right when things got fun, the government made booze, liquor, illegal for 10 years. You couldn't buy any liquor legally. Didn't stop people from drinking because they made their own gin. It's called bathtub gin. There were bootleggers everywhere, and they're having great parties at these places called speakeasies. They were essentially private nightclubs. You could go booze and dance and smoke cigarettes and uh, have fun. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to stop people from having fun. And uh, the women uh, got the right to vote. They cut their hair for once. Uh they shortened their skirts. They were showing their legs. They were having sex at a wedlock. They were smoking cigarettes right along with the boys. And the movies were reflecting that. This sort of joyful passion for living. And so movies were really, really popular. And people were going to movies like crazy, silent movies. There was no sound yet. They didn't invent it. Then they invented sound, and that changed also. Once you can record people talking, all of a sudden people will never shut up on movies. And they still don't. Television would be nowhere if people didn't talk. That's all they do is talk. Uh, talking can be good. It can be funny, or it could be burdensome. Anyway, so uh, in the 30s, uh, when you had talking movies, there was a depression. And so the depression said... You got to feed your family. You got to try to pay your rent, uh, and going to the movies is not that important. So Hollywood tries to figure out how to get your money. They know how to do it, folks. They still do, um, and so they created films that people would still go see. They would sacrifice a meal to go see a movie. That's how important cinema was, and Hollywood thrived in the '30s, although the rest of the world was not thriving. Record unemployment. People couldn't pay their rents, just similar to now. Uh, they couldn't even feed their families. There was food lines, food lines, but Hollywood figured out a way to get your money, to get our money. And so they created these genre films that were very, very popular in the 50s. Musicals, like maybe uh, Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire, maybe you've heard of these things. I can't show you an example because we don't have time, but uh, check it out. There's some great musicals. And essentially, they're fun. People wanted to escape their reality. So we're not hearing, we're not seeing a lot of hard-hitting social commentary in the 30s because people were already had enough of social comedy co commentary with their lives in reality. So they go to a musical, they see Fred Astaire dancing in a tuxedo, pure escapism, and uh, there's a relief from the depression. And then the other uh, genre in that day that was really popular was horror genre. That's right, monster films. Uh, that's when they became started becoming very, very popular. Movies like Frankenstein and The Mummy and The Werewolf and Dracula. Why were they so popular in that period of time? Well, a simple answer would be there was trouble brewing in Europe. The Nazi Party, National Socialist Party, was rising its ugly head in Europe, uh, led by Adolf Hitler, and this would be in the 
early 30s. He became into power then, and he was kind of a monster. We didn't know how bad it was going to get for another 10 years, but it got bad, folks. Um, and so Hollywood didn't know how to fight him. They didn't know what to do. So they created these monsters that we could actually fight. We could fight Dracula. Uh, we could fight the Frankenstein's monster. We could fight the mummy or the werewolf, but we couldn't fight Hitler. So these became really popular. Our first comic books that were dealing with superheroes, like, for example, uh, Superman, uh, was created with action comic books in the late 30s. And Superman, guess what he was fighting, folks? Hitler. That's why he was created, to go off and fight Hitler, Wonder Woman, the same way. They were fighting the evil axis in Europe. And so a whole genre of interesting pop culture, films, music, popped up around the fact that Hitler was on his merry way. It took him, you know, we're the last people involved in World War II. We came in late um, after essentially we are bombed in Pearl Harbor, then we joined up. Um, but they were, Hitler was bombing uh, had already taken over Poland, had already taken over, was coming into France, uh, was bombing London every day, uh, sending bombs from Germany to London. You can just across, if you've been to London, it's just across the, uh, the, uh, the channel, English Channel. And uh, they begged for help from us, and American people didn't want it. Uh, we had just gone through 20 years earlier, World War I. We lost a lot of guys. It was carnage of the highest order. We didn't want anything to do with war. And so we uh, told our politicians, no war. And FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was the president, and he wanted to help, but his hands were tied because he had to obey Congress and the Senate. And uh, so we didn't jump into war when other countries were having to jump in because Hitler was invading their countries and he wanted to invade England very bad. But the, cha the channel was challenging enough. And so he's just sending over bombs. Um, but the English persevered. So that's what's happening in World War II. Um, we become, we're a world at war. And then all of a sudden we're making films in the war years, and uh, they're essentially propaganda films to to help the war effort. And they starred guys like John Wayne and Van Johnson and so many PL, other actors who didn't, they got a deferments not to go to the war, and they made films here. But their films did a lot of good because it made people raise their awareness of the war, and they bought war bonds. That was hugely popular. You go to the movie theater and maybe cost you 75 cents to go to the movie. And then you buy $5 worth of war bonds. And that would help the war, help the war effort, our war effort, help build munitions, ships, everything. Um, that was how people were helping in this country. Uh, but that's after World War II began officially for us. In the early 1940s, Hollywood was still making movies. They're still trying to figure out how to get you in the in the uh, movie seats. The movies changed again. Uh, some great, some of our greatest cinema in our history was made during the war years. Not necessarily all about the war, but a lot of it was. And um, so that's what's happening in World War II. And then, and then post-war would be after we the war is over, we came home to a different landscape. The landscape had changed. We no longer are, uh, our movie taste had changed. We didn't want to watch frivolous uh, screwball comedies. We didn't want to watch monster movies. We didn't want to watch musicals. We wanted to see more reality. And so then a whole new era of filmmaking began uh, with re what they call realism uh, based on Italian neorealism. And I'm going to, you guys are going to watch this documentary. That's what you're going to write the paper on, and you'll see what I'm talking about once you look at this documentary. Um, I'm, all, I'm only going to go to the post 1950s today. I'm going to try to hit the 60s and 70s in another two days, 
and try to get the rest of it done by next week. It's a lot to cover, and I'm going to talk fast. But, and I'm going to miss a lot of stuff. Like, for example, in the 30s, another highly, highly popular genre was what they call the screwball comedy. Nowadays, we call it a rom-com. Um, they're hugely popular. And usually, um, films like um, Bringing a Baby in Philadelphia Story, smart films, uh, films like... Uh, our man Goffrey, my man Goffrey, they were essentially making a statement about, and they're usually making fun of rich people, those movies, uh, because still people still had riches in the 30s, Depression era, and they were still living in fancy penthouses and going to parties while everybody else was waiting in food lines. And so they made these movies, and it was always very um, critical of the upper classes, mocking them. And that became hugely popular because then you could go to a movie theater. You don't have a job. You could barely pay your rent. Your kids are hungry. You go to a movie theater and you get to see Cary Grant making fun of uh, Catherine Hepburn or somebody and Carol Lombard. And you go, so the rich are kind of getting their comeuppance in film. That was another popular genre. Another popular genre that was in that area was Westerns. Um, they were popular because their escapism we could go back to our sh sh brief history. You know, Westerns were, were 50, 60 years away from the Old West, really. And um, that all changed in 1930, not um, adult themes. And I don't mean adult like X-rated guys. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about mature behavior with the mature people. Most Westerns up until then were simply good guys against bad guys. And uh, really simplistic stories. They called them melodramas meaning it's exaggerated drama. There's the bad cattle baron who's trying to push off the farmers, and so it's good against bad. Stagecoach, complicated things. Stagecoach is a legendary film that made John Wayne a star. He had been in movies for 10 years, but they're just not very good movies. He was making a living, but he wasn't the household name he became. Stagecoach changed all that, and it's a complicated story about 10 people on, or 8 or 9 people on a stagecoach going across hostile Indian country, and each of them have a different story. Uh, the Ringo Kid, which is John Wayne, is, is supposedly a gunfighter. Uh, he's out for revenge. Then he falls in love with the prostitute with the hotter gold. And then there's the doctor who's an alcoholic, and then there's the rich guy, and the, he's the banker who's... who's uh, Stolen a bunch of money from the bank. He's on the run. They all have an interesting story. There's the school marm who's pregnant and is very uh, prim and proper and hates the prostitute, of course. But then the prostitute turns out to be the best person in the bunch because she's got, I hate to say it, folks, a heart of gold. Uh, and John Wayne, of course, falls in love with her without really knowing who she is because he's kind of a naive guy. And uh, they're going to end up together. He's going to end up with... Folks, the prostitute. Um, anyway, so that movie was the first time we had all these interesting, conflicted stories um, about complicated adult people. Um, who was the good guys? Who was the bad guys? And that's where it got good because everybody has good and bad in them. And even the school marm is so prim and proper, she's very racist. She's very uh, privileged. She looks down on anybody who isn't like she is. And so there's that character. Anyway, so that movie set the template for hundreds of movies since then. They've been following the similar stories. So things are popping. 1939, we're coming out of the Depression. Films changed big time. Finally, people are back to work, FDR started this program, federal program, to build buildings and bridges and freeways for the first time. We had highways that actually were connecting all the states together. Um, yes, the taxpayers paid for it. Even the arts had their own um, federally funded art scene. And... Um, theater started to thrive again and um, 
a gentleman by the name of Orson Welles, who you're going to see in a minute, a documentary, uh, benefited from that big time. Talk about Citizen Kane, uh, which came out in 1941, right when the right before the war started. He made this movie called Maybe You've Heard of About It. Citizen Kane. He was 25 years old, and it's it's a revolutionary movie. I wish I could show it to you guys, but I can't find a free copy of it. It's you can pay for it. Um, so we're gonna watch a documentary instead, which they, they hit on it a bit. Um, but usually we watch it in my film class, but we don't have the luxury of right that right now. So um, I'm just going to talk up until these post-war films in the 1950s. We came out of the 50s. And we wanted something different about our with our films, and we also were kind of demanding something different, more realism. And that came from the Italians, believe it or not. Uh, Federico De Sica, uh, Mike, uh, Rosalini made Open City. De Sica made Bicycle Thieves. Uh, I'm going to show this documentary. You'll see it. Uh, you'll have to go watch it, and you'll see a little excerpts from that. And they made them in Italy, literally almost during the German occupation. Uh, that's how dangerous filmmaking was, but also shows you the power of filmmaking and cinema, even in time of occupation, directors and writers still want to get their story out. And we're not talking people are going to make any money. They're not movie stars. They're not rich living in Beverly Hills. They're living in war tone Rome. And um, the Germans were still occupied there when they made Open City. And he used... Uh, Rosalini used long lenses, meaning that's a telephoto lens. He would hide them in buildings, and he'd shoot from a distance so nobody could see him shooting. And you could see, actually, Germans patrolling the streets. Now, by then, uh, Hitler uh, was on the run. The war was essentially lost, and Hitler is hiding in the bunker days from killing himself. But his some of his troops were still occupying but the fight had gone out of them because they saw the writing on the wall, folks. The war was winding down and they'd lost. Um, and they didn't want to be considered war criminals. So they weren't quite as aggressive as they was, were during their heyday. But they're still there. They're still a presence. And so he made this movie called Open City. And, uh, and it was a revolution. And then uh, just... Federico de C uh, Victoria de Sico made um, Bicycle Thieves, another revolutionary film. Simple story about a guy who can't provide for his child in post-World War II Italy, Rome. And so he gets a job only because he has a bicycle. There's no cars, folks. Nobody has a car. Nobody, ga nobody has gas. But if you have a bicycle, that's huge. And so he gets a job putting up posters around the town. Well, he's putting up posters one day, and he gets his bicycle stolen. The rest of the movie is him looking for the bicycle thief. And it's tragic because he, he loses his job over it. He can't feed his kid, and they're literally, literally starving to death. He's trying to do the best he can. And the seeker went on the streets of Rome with a handheld camera with amateur actors uh, it's not a fancy movie, but it's revolutionary because it showed that you can make a story in a real location with real people and still being engaging and engrossing and people want to see it as much as they want to see a Fred Astaire musical. And so uh, Bicycle Thieves is a heartbreaking movie because at the end, the father gives up hope and then he sees a bicycle sitting on the side of the street. And guess what, folks? He makes the bad decision to steal it. So the bicycle, the person who got his bicycle stolen now steals a bicycle. That's why it's called Bicycle Thieves. And, but he gets caught. And his son, his young son, who's eight or nine years old, sees him. And he's ashamed that his father actually stooped this low. But his father's not a bad guy. He's just, just trying to provide for his kid. And so the moral of the story is 
he's not punished, but he is in shame because no matter what, even if you steal to, to provide food for your child, there's still a cost price to pay and he pays the price. Anyway, um, filmed on the streets with real people, non-professional actors and, um, Jessica went on to have a huge career. So did Rosalini. Uh, they stayed in Italy. Some, then they came to Hollywood, some of them, after the war. So Americans saw these movies they, in the 50s. And directors like Ilya Kazan and uh, William Wilder. Uh, I'm sorry. Billy Wilder, William Wilder. Uh, and others saw these movies and um, wanted to make something new in America. People like John Sturgis and Anthony Mann were making westerns that weren't simple melodramas. Nobody wanted to see simplistic. They wanted to see something innovating and new and real. Film to work started during this time. Uh, that's black cinema for you folks who know French a little. Um, Essentially, it's it's a shady characters living in the twilight world of small time crimes, big time crimes. Maybe they became hugely popular. Uh, there was no more heroes anymore. It's kind of anti heroes. The hero of the piece could be Humphrey Bogart as a private detective. He's he's not a bad guy, but he's not a great guy. But he's not as bad as the guys who are really the bad guys. And he he still has a moral ethical code that he lives by. And so the audience roots for him. Even though he's a loner, he's a dr drunk, alcoholic, veteran, smokes too many cigarettes, sarcastic, cynical, no family, no wife, a loner. That became hugely popular in the 50s. And then three actors came up through the 1950s that changed how we look at actors in this world. There, the, and there was Marlon Brando, Montgomery Clift, and James Dean. This documentary you're going to look at tonight will cover each one, one of them for a brief moment. They changed the course of history by bringing a new realism to acting. They no longer were beautiful guy, boys or women that were saying lines, movie star types uh, like Clark Gable or Gary Cooper. And I love those guys. Um, these guys were supposedly every, every man. Everybody could relate to them. They were flawed. They actually weren't that, they weren't completely manly. Sometimes they might even cry. We never saw that before. They changed the face of acting. Uh, a person by the name of Ilya Kazan started the actor studio. He's a legendary acting teacher. Uh, they all, so many people came through the actor studio in, in New York. It was the place to be, Brando, James Dean, uh, Brando also went off with Stella Adler, uh, off branch of the actor studio, and they studied acting, folks. They actually studied their craft. Um, it's not by accident that they developed who they are. But what they did was uh, method acting, at a real brief class in method acting, simple. It's sense memory. Uh, that's the difference. So if you're in a scene, you're an actor, and you're supposed to be angry, you're supposed to be thinking of a scene from your personal life that made you angry. And so when you're, when you get angry for the camera, it looks real. And so if you uh, need to cry, you've got to figure out a scene from your own real life. Somebody dying, your dog dying, something to make you cry for real. Method actors were known as being pains and asses. People don't like them because they require all this extra care and uh, which usually pays off because they're usually brilliant on the camera. The camera picks up all this stuff in minute detail because the camera's running their face. And like Bergman, Ingmar Bergman said, he's great, a Swedish filmmaker, he said, the eyes are the soul to everybody's character. So Bergman always filmed very deep close ups on people's eyes because he says, that's where your soul is. Anyway, so now we got actors that are changing the landscape. Directors like Ilya Kazan are changing the landscape with movies like Streetcar Named Desire and On the Waterfront. And Billy Wilder is 
directing Stalag 17 and Sunset Boulevard. And he's, he's, he's actually from Nazi Germany, but he escaped before the Nazis took over. And so many more. William Wilder directed the great uh, Best Years of Our Lives. John Ford is still directing movies. Things have changed big time. And people are demanding more realism in the movies they're going to. And that all started post-World War II. Yeah. So that's a quick rundown. What I want you guys to do, you have Canopy. You have to go to Shasta College website. I'll, I'll, I'll put all this in the announcement. Maybe you used Canopy before. Uh, you have to go to the Shasta College website. You have to go to the library. Click on library. Click on streaming videos. You'll have two choices, videos on demand and uh, Canopy. Click on Canopy and then type in the words post-World War Post-war cinema, it's and you'll it'll pop up. It's a documentary that I own, and I showed in class, and they finally got it on Canopy. I asked them to do it, and they got it. So now you can see it in the comfort of your own home. Each of these episodes takes an hour. Uh, Post-World War, post-war cinema, World War II cinema, uh, will cover some of the stuff I, I've covered today in more detail. Uh, watch it. The next one you watch is 1950s uh, American movies. It's called Sex and Melodrama. Yeah, folks, sex. Um, Marlon Brando in a torn shirt. Marilyn Monroe with uh, lots of cleavage showing. Uh, people were having sex now in movies, that, and it was naughty sex. It, they don't show it still because we still have censors, but uh, it's implied. Uh, you know Marlon Brando's having sex. You know Marilyn Monroe's having sex. We don't have to see it, but we know it because of the, the way they act, their attitudes. Um, it's called Sex and Melodrama. It's 60 minutes. Watch both of them or watch one of them. I don't care. It'd be nice if you watched both of them and wrote your paper on both of them. Uh, write three pages, essay critical essay on what you saw, what you see, what you hear in the documentaries. you got to watch the documentaries, folks. You can't read about it. I mean, you can if you got the cinema book, but this isn't that class, so you don't have it. Uh, so watch these documentaries. It's going to take you two hours to watch them. Take notes and tell me what you saw, what you heard. Don't tell me if you like it or not. That's not what I bothered by. I don't want to know that. I just want to know if you got anything out of it. And let it seep into you. This is the history of cinema that's really important. And all your heroes to this day, whether it's, I don't know who your heroes are, whether it's Ben Cooper or uh, Lady Gaga or, or Tom Cruise, they're all standing on the shoulders of these people here in these documentaries. Uh, without them, there would be no, any of these people nowadays. So watch those. I'll post it on the assignments. I'll post the, the uh, the directions, the canopy, and the whole bit, and then you'll see the titles. Go to it, watch them, and uh, take notes, and uh, that'll be where your paper is going to be, and that'll be due on Monday. That'll be your last paper uh, besides your journal, but we're going to still talk about films, uh, still going to be discussing films, and still got a ways to go. Uh, so hope you're enjoying any, some of this, getting something out of it. It is a quick thumbnail sketch of Hollywood cinema that's as complicated as any art form that there's ever been. And I'm only covering such a sliver of uh, what can be covered. Um, if you guys ever go to a four-year college and you continue with cinema studies, you will study one director, one single director for a whole semester. I did that for years. Um, studied Eli Kazan and and so many others. Anyway, uh, Bergman, my beloved Ingmar Bergman. We can't really cover too many foreign films in this class right now, so I'm kind of sticking with American cinema right now. But uh, I'll try to get you guys to watch a foreign film. Have you ever watched one? Yes, it has subtitles, folks. Uh, you got to read the dialogue. Anyway, um, that's it. Go watch those documentaries. Write your paper. And... Uh, I'll see you on the next time. I'll do another release in a couple days. Look at your announcements. Look at your assignments. I'll be posting everything.
Stay cool. Thanks. <laughs>